everybody. So excited to have you here with us, all of you. I am just can't wait for this conversation, so we're going to jump right in. I'm going to just briefly provide a little background about our friend Jeff Rochester, an advisor and friend to the Sun Valley Forum um, since very early on, and I'm just so grateful for your partnership. Um, introduced us to amazing people like Jonathan Webb here today, and really look forward to this conversation. And, and to Mark and to Jeff, your insights along the way, which you always bring to conversation. So thank you. So Jeff Rochester uh, is recognized thought leader, corporate responsibility, nonprofit management, social entrepreneurship. He advises nonprofits, social enterprises, and corporate brand leaders. You can read his full bio, but he has incredible clients, including our friends at App Harvest, American Farmland Trust, Vote.org, uh, MindSpark Learning, and Jeff was previously chief marketing officer at the Nature Conservancy and also a marketing uh, leader in various corporations and, and really, really grateful for you. Thanks, Jeff. I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Amy. And I love being at Sun Valley. Uh, I've, been, I've known the organization a couple of years now and it set the tone for today's arm conversation. What I love about Sun Valley is the sessions are smaller, more intimate. People tend to be honest and authentic, respectful, but honest. So you don't tend to get the typical pablum that you get at these convenings. Uh, I wanted to set up today's conversation, uh, and I'll read you literally the description, and I'll give you some more context. But we're here to talk about broad adoption of regenerative agriculture and its benefits, such as job creation, economic opportunity, the role of education in the growth of the local and regional food economies, and the importance of diversity and partnerships in building thriving and regenerative systems. So the day has been about regeneration. I wanted to add some further context. What I want to hear from the speakers as we move through this is learnings from COVID. Uh, you know, we're clearly in a moment in this country where we're talking about racial injustice, Floyd, um, and so I'd love to hear over the course of the next 45 minutes how the speakers feel that touches their work, how they're addressing it. I also think it's important to talk about the role of the government, the federal and the national and local relative to private sector. Something I speak on all the time is the fact that Edelman, the marketing firm, has been doing a study for about 10 or 15 years, and they talk about the relative trust amongst people in about 15 or 20 different countries. The relative trust that we all have in governmental institutions, private sector, uh, media, and nonprofits. And the data, the data says over time that people around the world are looking more for nonprofits, for profits, and are less reliant and less trusting of uh, governments and media. So I also want to hear you all talk about your experience relative to private sector, working with nonprofits, meaning in, and the gaps you're seeing with the government uh, in terms of their response and collaboration. So um, with no further ado, what I'd love to do is turn it over to Amy first and have her talk about her background and what she's up to, and then Jonathan. So about six or seven minutes for each of you. Great. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Jonathan. I'm excited to be part of this conversation. I'm going to share my screen. I have a couple uh, slides just to present along with my little introduction. So bear with me as I pull up those screens. Okay, hopefully you can see that now. Yep. Okay, perfect. So thank you all for um, inviting me to be part of this group of visionaries, leaders, and advocates in the food system. Uh, my name is Amy Mateus. I'm the program co-director of the Local Food Alliance at yeah. Valley Institute. Um, food has been a passion of mine since I was a child. My earliest memories, like a lot of people share, are being in the kitchen with my mom and my grandmother. And my grandmother um, really inspired my way of life with trips to the local food co-op with our reusable bags in hand, composting in the roadside mediums, and showing um, her love of feeding family, friends, and strangers at every chance she got. I am honored to have her legacy with me connected to the intentional living that uh, pushes my work forward um, in the roles that I play within our organization here in Sun Valley, Idaho. Uh, the Local Food Alliance is now a program of the Sun Valley Institute. It was founded in 2014 with the purpose of uplifting local farmers, markets, restaurants, and adv advocates dedicated to transforming the culture in our regional food shed. While we've been successful at raising awareness of our local food system, showcasing our regional bounty, and providing needed support to our small farmers and ranchers, 
we know that it wasn't enough to just build a robust food system that way. While continuing to strengthen the fabrics of the, our local food system, we wanted to envision a co-created tapestry that wove together each strand and each stakeholder. Um, in October of 2019, we had the opportunity to participate in the Rockefeller Foundation Open IDO and Second Muse Food Vision Prize platform. Uh, it was a Food Vision Prize for 2050. So we utilized our broad network of stakeholders, our experiences working in the food system, and our passion to create a collective vision for a food system that truly regenerates the ecosystem, boosts the economic prosperity of all land stewards across the region, and provides nourishing food for all. Um, while we recognize that the need for transformation is at a global scale, a lot of change does start here at the grassroots, the local level. So we're embrace, embracing the nuances from place to place as a way of showcasing our appreciation for the natural world. Here in Southern Idaho, we have a diverse landscape from the high mountain peaks to the deeply carved Snake River Canyon, geothermal and solar abundance that makes a living Living in alignment with nature, so inspiring for us here. Wilderness is truly in the veins of most Idahoans and those who are able to visit here have heard the call of our gem state uniqueness. Unfortunately, we're also experiencing degenerating natural resources, desertification, and the dwindling of the Snake River Aquifer, poor watershed health, harming native fish populations like the iconic salmon, and growing concerns with fires, droughts, and soil degradation while we're also seeing one of the biggest population booms across the nation, yet the economic decline of our rural communities. Through our vision, Southern Idaho will become a region revitalized environmentally, economically, and socially. One that visionaries and leaders around the world and the country come to take inspiration from as a model of life lived with abundance and possibility. I'll go just into a little bit of detail about our vision itself. Um, I'm going to ask maybe our tech person to drop our link to the full food vision in the chat box at some point. There's a lot here, but I'm hoping that this does a decent uh, summary of it all for you all. So our vision is grounded in agricultural practices that regenerate ecosystems, restore watersheds, and mitigate risk from climate volatility. By 2050, we envision the agricultural sector as the largest component of the workforce, while also providing living wages with fair benefits, safe occupational settings and additional compensation for farmers providing ecosystem services on the land that they manage. By 2050, the technology used in here will mimic natural resources, natural systems, eliminating waste and enhancing natural resource use to really build that regeneration. Technology also needs to be peer to peer and available for all and not just focused on those who can afford the high costs of tech that are currently here. Um, our vision relies upon the ingenuity of indigenous and contemporary land stewards to mimic natural systems to the benefit of our society. Community members will have the knowledge of and the passion for growing, sourcing, cooking regional meals, and eating a diversity of regionally sourced fruits, vegetables, grains, and animal products. In 2050, we envision that every meal enjoyed by residents or visitors of Southern Idaho will be connected to our regional food system. Our vision is really based on diversity diversity on our farmlands and plates in our communities where we're truly honoring relationships with and gratitude for each other and the natural world that has been cultivated. Um, so this this slide is a roadmap and it might, I hope it's not too hard to see. I know the, the words are a little small, so we don't need to go into super detail on all of that, but um, systems change and place-based impact are necessary for this vision to come to life. Um, these are not just individual parts, but the sum of the whole that works in synergy together creates this vision. While we present this roadmap to our 2050 vision, the reality is that this vision is reliant upon regional collaboration, interdisciplinary engagement, and uplifting the voices of the disenfranchised. Our vision looks at layers of transformation, from policy to technology, diet to culture, economy to environment. While 2050 feels far away, each day, each month, each year provides us with an opportunity to work together, to dream together, and transform together. I'm honored to be a part of this conversation, and I hope we inspire you to get involved with transformation, whether it be on the global level, the local level, because we truly need individuals engaged in this work across all platforms and sectors, because together we truly can cultivate a future that is nourishing and regenerative for all. So I think that about ends my slideshow. I'm going to stop sharing. And okay, did I stop? Okay.
Thank you all for that. I hope that was a good overview of our vision. I know there's a lot there, but please feel free to ask um, more questions about it or read our full vision that we've shared online. Great. And Jonathan? Yeah, well, one, thanks, uh, Amy uh, and Amy for, for having me here. And, and Jeff, uh, we, we, we've, uh, we've been spending a lot of time together in the past couple of days, so it's good to, good to continue the conversation here. Um, yeah, we, we at App Harvest believe that um, technology has got to be a part of the overall agriculture solution in order to, to bring capacity online um, and, and get production and supply uh, available uh, using, 90, for, for example, our, our systems use 90% less water uh, than an open field ag and, and 30 times more. So, Amy, on the food system vision, I, what's the biggest obstacle you see in terms of making that successful? I mean, it looks good in theory, but in reality, like what what – what are the top two or three things that are enabling conditions to really make that happen? Yeah, so thanks for expanding that from one to two or three, because I think it's hard to just yeah. narrow it down one. But I think one of the main barriers that I see is that um, a lot of communities are really reliant on industrial commodity agriculture right now. We have corporations that are funding public schools through tax revenue, through private foundations and donations. So to just cancel them out of the equation does not set us up for a real just transition. So I think getting those types of stakeholders into the conversation is a barrier and an opportunity. Um, we, we need to share this uh, vision with everyone to really create that future. Um, the other barriers I think are capital. Um, we need money for this type of transition. We need farmers to have access to resources and they can't wear all the risk on themselves. We need the risk to be kind of spread out to all the players in the game to really have a fair playing field for those farmers and ranchers to be leaders in this transformation. And then I think the other barrier is just gonna come down to our consumer driven culture. We like things that are cheap, easy, fast, convenient. Real good quality food, unfortunately, is not that right now. Um, I don't necessarily want regenerative ag to be the next McDonald's, but I think when we talk about food justice, um, food security, we have to talk about affordability here. And so far, um, a lot of foodieism is very elite. And how do we get real nutrient dense, locally grown food to be affordable? And that's a barrier in our vision. I don't really have solutions for that. I do believe the economic model of we increase the supply will decrease the cost. But I think there's other things culturally to consider as well. Like maybe we do have to spend a little bit more of our income on food as a percentage of our income spending. And how is the Department of Ag doing on this whole conversation? Are, are they leaning in and leading? Are they a laggard? Are they off to the side? Or are they very aggressively engaged and regenerative in these conversations? I think, you know, it's hard for me to speak for them, but I do know that uh, our department here in Idaho is very focused on export global markets. So I think um, they see this local food movement as a very niche market. So getting them to see the opportunities for an expansion of our GDP, an expansion of our agricultural sector, that's key. And we're using the vision as a platform to engage in those conversations. But so far, they've just very much started with our department of ag here and then what's your learning from covid oh gosh so much i mean i think you know covid while i've been working in food system transformation for many years now knowing very acutely that our food system is not necessarily broken but it is not built to be just and equitable not built for economic and environmental resilience so i think covid actually helped open up the eyes of many people working in this world to see the power that food systems hold. Um, I think a lot of people didn't really know how bad things were until we saw supply chains being disrupted, until we saw food being dumped and people going hungry. That really awakened people to the disconnects in our food system, to the reasons why we grow more food than the world needs, yet we can't actually get it to the people who are in most need of eating. Um, and those are problems that are systemic and within the system that we can change. And I think COVID is allowing us to have these conversations. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're back with Jonathan now. So Jonathan, why don't you uh, reboot and tell us what you're up to and then we'll marry the two conversations. Yeah, so um, sorry about that, went offline. 
So yeah, it, it's you know from from our my so one to back up just a step. I my background was building large scale solar development. So large scale sustainable project development and energy, and now coming over to ag uh, and, and building building large um, indoor farms uh, in our region of, of eastern Kentucky, central Appalachia. Uh, but again, w- was trying to right before cut out say that you know the complement between. Our, our viewpoint in App Harvest is is there's there's multi fifty where we have seventy percent more food uh, to feed the growing population. So again, if you look at the UN reports, that uh, some UN officials are saying we have sixty years left of topsoil uh, before we'll point. Jonathan, you're or- sticking. Why don't you turn off your camera? Turn off your camera and just use your audio. You're sticking. I don't know why. Jeff, is that helpful? Yeah, go ahead. So again, our, our viewpoint here at App Harvest is that uh, we, we have got to, it, it's an all of the above approach on on, um, on get to a 2050 world, where again, if the UN is saying we need 70% more food by 2050, uh, how do we get there? So I, I was at Berkeley a little bit uh, earlier last year at the Half Earth Summit uh, with E.O. Wilson and spoke there. Um, and, and many of the folks there are predicting that you know, to get to 70 percent more food, to feed nine billion people in a rising middle class, growing food the way we currently grow it, you would need almost two planet Earths to have enough. So our view at App Harvest uh, using both technology to where we can we can grow with 90 percent less water, 30 times yield per acre. But then do up to do that to free up land and water uh, for four season farming and organic farming and regenerative agriculture to where we're not putting such pressure uh, on our soils and on our water. So it, it's it's in our viewpoint and all of the above strategy. And even here in Kentucky, uh, Jeff, you were with us yesterday. We, we've been very close with our governor. You can kind of read some announcements. Uh, that just came out this past month. It's been our, our governor's first public announcement since COVID, uh, and he's making making agriculture one of his top, it really is top economic development priority coming out of COVID. Uh, and part of that was because of of a multitude of reasons. One, uh, during COVID here, we, we had we had confidential conversations uh, around the state, and there was you know deep concern about. Uh, run on groceries and the lack of food security and stability and supply. We we are so reliant uh, on 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 other countries for our food. We've seen produce imports from Mexico to the U.S. nearly triple the last ten years. Uh, App Harvest will be growing tomatoes exclusively in our first facility, uh, and four billion pounds of tomatoes came out of Mexico into the U.S. last year. That was one point two billion pounds of tomatoes. Uh, that came out of Mexico and into the U.S. 15 years ago. Um, you know, we're trucking those fruits and vegetables six, seven, eight days on a semi truck. Uh, think about the consumption transport. We're picking those fruits uh, when they're not ripe, so they don't have the nutrient density. Uh, they're they're being picked green, and then we're spraying them to where they can ripen. Or they're being sprayed to where they ripen on the truck before they come to a grocer. So, you know, our viewpoint is localize it, regionalize it, all the above. Uh, use technologies where you can, and and then use good farming practices on soils uh, when when uh, when they can be complemented back and forth. And and I think you know for someone like Amy and and. You know her platform and, and what you all are doing uh, there. It, it, again, it's totally different than what we're doing here, but both really, uh, hopefully, as we move forward, you know, we'll complement each other. And and I get asked all the time, well, well, who's the competition in agriculture? Who's who are you going after? What? And it's really just dirty agriculture. It, it's people that are using harsh chemical pesticides and destroying our soils and, and destroying our water. It's 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 the 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 labor practices that that are just atrocious in agriculture that, that we, you know, coming out of COVID, you know, app harvest, we, we've said, you know, we already had this business model of we, every person in our facility will make a living wage. We'll have full health care benefits. Uh, we'll have access to ownership 
uh, in, in, in our company and why I've paid time off. We already had that built into our model. And so I think coming out of COVID, how, how do we say every sector in agriculture definitely has an opportunity to say, let's, let's raise the bar of what is possible in ag. Let's not, let's not price and, and destroy our planet and, and, and really harm people uh, in order to get a lower cost per pound, uh, let, let's create systems locally and regionally and, and put standards in place. And, and we're very fortunate here where uh, we, we have a congressional delegation that, that in D.C. is very supportive. And we, we have a governor and, and we're trying to take the approach of, of using both technology like App Harvest, but then also making sure we're working with, with local uh, farmers to, to ensure that, you know, they're adopting the best possible practices uh, on their soils and, and, and on their waterways. So uh, look forward to the conversation. And, and Jeff, uh, you know what we're doing here pretty well. So feel free to guide, us, guide me in any way to, to where you think I can be helpful here on this topic. Hey, Jeff, you're muted. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, so thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Amy. And I want to pepper the conversation with advice for the audience. And Amy, you did a good job of this. Amy uh, Christensen, you did a good job of this earlier. Uh, can you both talk, just digress for a minute, about funding sources for your work? So so Amy, t tell me, like, how are you funding your work? And for the audience, if there are sources or tips you want to give them, on how to power this kind of work. And same thing for you, Jonathan, where's the investment coming from? And if somebody wants to start the next app harvest, like where should they be looking for for capital? Amy? Great, thank you for that. Um, so we are a nonprofit. I would say the majority of our funding comes from individual donors, family foundations, supporters of our work like that. We do apply for grants. Um, we ask for some funding from our county and municipality level, not a huge amount, but that comes through, which shows the buy-in from our municipalities, which is great. Um, one of the reasons that we did take on this Food Vision prize, it was a, it was a prize platform that would help really fund us. Um, the prize itself is 200,000, which would double our program budget and allow us to do a lot more work. So I think a lot of the people um, in this field bootstrap it and we work really really hard and we're driven by our passion for this and we would love to see funding come in to really support us and put even more people in this line of work so again for the audience if there's anyone that knows of funding sources for amy please get those to amy christensen and jonathan where, how did you get your initial seed capital yeah so jeff we we, we identified the problem early um, and, and agriculture. And, and again, I come from the energy world. So uh, wind and solar development is my background, but I grew up in Kentucky, which is uh, one of the first, second, third largest coal producing states in the U.S. So seeing what's happened in energy where we've transformed systems at scale uh, with wind and solar taking off rapidly. And then, and then I, I had the viewpoint uh, here in Kentucky where many of my friends and people I knew that worked in the coal industry. So I saw every coal company in the region go bankrupt. Uh, so this idea that the transformation at scale cannot happen rapidly in agriculture, uh, again, I, I just, I continue to say to anybody I can talk to, just look at the energy world uh, 20 years ago versus, uh, and, and to, you know, to just, just look at, look at how rapidly that shifted. Um, and, and so as far as how, how we raised capital, Jeff, uh, we wanted to build a business model around the problem. So, you know, again, what's the problem in the U.S.? Well, produce imports to, to the U.S. from Mexico have tripled. And, and why is that bad for the U.S. And, and, and the environment? Because we're trucking fruits and vegetables seven or eight days. Uh, it, we, should not be, we should not be shipping produce around the world or trucking any fruit or vegetable uh, 2,000 miles. That, that just doesn't make sense uh, for, for people or planet. Um, so, so our business model was was scale. We we had to build a really large facility to get our unit economics down. Uh, we're a B Corp, but we're also a registered benefit corporation. So I don't just have fiduciary responsibility to my shareholders. Uh, I also have a responsibility to our stakeholders uh, that are that are our community and our environment. And what we found, Jeff, over the last three years, so we raised our first seed round of capital in February 2018, and that was $250,000 with, with Steve Case and Rise of the Rest. 
And then fast forward, and within 18 months, we had raised nearly $120 million. Uh, I come from a very humble background, grew up from public, went to public schools growing up in a public university, and it was startling to me to see the amount of capital flooding in for what we were doing. And, and I think on the private sector side, what we're seeing is that there are the right caliber investors out there that want to make really long-term bets and systemic change. And, and, and you know, they're trying to find the companies that are just going to shake and rattle systems to their core. And, and, and you just have to find those investors. I wouldn't say it's 50% of the world. I wouldn't say it's 20% of the world. But I, I think, you know, this conversation around ESG investing is we're getting to a point where there are real investors that, that have it true and near dear to, to their investment profile. Uh, Jeff Oban is, is who's working with us. He, he was the founder of Value Act Capital, uh, the, the $16 billion fund. He's been known as a hedge fund activist and investor. And he's even said, you know, he's been a part of the problem throughout his investment career. And now he wants to use his tools, which is investing in private sector to try to rebuild systems. And, and for investors, it's really just the right thing to do because if if 10, 15 years from now, your company is not aligned with people and planet, consumers and regulators are going to stamp you out. And again, for anyone that, that thinks this isn't going to happen rapidly in agriculture, I encourage everybody to look at what's happened in the coal industry here in central Appalachia. It's turned on a dime rapidly. Uh, so with folks like Amy, who have a totally different model that's you know, complementary to what we're doing. And, and as these solutions unravel, it's, it's you know, for me, very exciting time to, to see the investment dollars that, that are flooding into ag. And, and I think we collectively and, and with forums like this need to just continue to raise the profile of the solutions. Uh, and, and for us, the private sector capital is out there, but, but we're also seeing, you know, just government and nonprofits that, that are willing to support efforts. So, you know, it's just a time where we got to put big solutions on the table uh, and go for the home runs. And, and those home runs are attracting dollars uh, to, to try to get people to the table to, to try to, to go after some of the solutions. And uh, for all of you, uh, you know, we'll be taking Q&A's from the audience in about five more minutes. Um, and and just just again, because I want to make sure these sessions are as pragmatic as possible for people. For those of you looking for impact capital, one of the groups Jonathan mentioned is Rise of the Rest, and they're looking to put VC money in the middle of the country. 90% of all VC money in this country goes to uh, California, New York, and the state of Massachusetts. So App Harvest is also a case study and someone betting on the middle of the country. And that's where we need the capital. So Sean, I know you're looking to fund your initiative. Several people on this webinar may be looking. So Rise of the Rest is a good source. Let me move to uh, a topic that I think the three of us have all talked about, which is retail. So it's easy to demonize imports coming in from Mexico for pesticides or labor practices. But at the end of the day, what's the role of Walmart? What's the role of Amazon? What's the role of Whole Foods in driving your agendas, right? You're trying to redefine how we think about vegetables and produce and ag. Are those kinds of big box retailers, are they helpful? Are they leaning in or are they passive on these issues? Amy? Um, so I, I would say that, you know, retailers have a huge opportunity here to put their money in a future that we all really want to align with. I think, unfortunately, we do see a lot of greenwashing. As Robin said earlier, carbon washing, which I like that term a lot as well. And I think... Um, what happens is, is that we're all functioning in the food system on really slim margins and to expect retailers to kind of shut down that model and to pay the fair prices to farmers. I, I have a hard time seeing that happening, but I do think that retailers have an opportunity to invite farmers and ranchers to the table, invite food entrepreneurs to the table and have conversations about how to have more equitable value chains. And I'd really like to see um, these type of retailers start to have those conversations because what I've heard from the farmers that I work with is that it's still undervaluing their product. They're still not able to make a profit, even if they can get into Whole Foods or Kroger or something like that. It's still not making it an economic model for them. And that is, at the end of the day, that's really what I need to see happen here in Idaho is farmers have to make money. They have to be able to pay their bills, support their family, pay for health care. And that's not the case right now. And I don't know if Whole Foods, Walmart are willing to make that their main motive. 
Jonathan, your experience? Well, Jeff, you, you know I'm incredibly passionate about this, and uh, it's, it's for a lot of different reasons. But, um, you know, we, we've talked about cleaning up the energy world. Um, it, and I go back to I'm from coal, you know, I'm from the area of, of the U.S. Where, where much of our coal was produced. And, and if we thought, you know, coal was, was in many ways dirty, uh, or if people claim that, you know, it, that operators were not out operating in a certain way, uh, agriculture to me has been beyond jarring. And, and you know, people like Amy uh, and, and her platform and, and the hardworking people that she's working with, the competition reality is, is, is just startling. And, and we have a head grower on our team, Pepe, who, who's operated some of the largest facilities in Mexico. Uh, Pepe had a brain tumor taken out. His daughters had tumors and many of his friends because that's how much chemical pesticides he was forced to use on his farms. Using chemical pesticides three times a week on the farm that you can legally use once a year in the U.S. Paying people $50 a month, a week for 12 hours of day of labor, five days a week. This is our competition. That's Amy's competition. So when those farmers in Idaho are treating the soils good, treating the waterways good, you know, paying a living wage to people, and oh, by the way, that's our competition. It is, I, I was with Secretary Purdue uh, right before COVID, Jeff, um, and had this very conversation, which is, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And is it regulators, is it consumers? But, you know, Walmart, Kroger, Costco, everybody has an opportunity here to, to help clean up agriculture treat every worker fairly, treat our soils and, and waterways the way they should be. And the environmental and social pieces of that are just going to get priced into food. And that's just the reality. It's been a race to the bottom on price. We have destroyed our planet and we're we are really harming people in order to have a race to the bottom on, on price as it relates to agriculture. And as a result, uh, we have a food system uh, that in many ways is very, 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 very fragile and and, and broken. And and for Amy and, and others uh, who, who have local and regionalized platforms with, with incredible growers, and you're right, Amy, I mean, the farmers here in Kentucky, I mean, I'm in tears when I meet with them. I mean, they, these are some of the hardest working people you can see putting everything they have into their crop, treating the soils right, and then they can't get a profit, but they can't get a profit because if you look at their competition and you look at the practices that are being used, this is not fair. It is not fair. And we, we as the, you know, the, the environmental community, uh, the social community, I mean, we have got to ratchet up. We have got to escalate the conversation. Uh, it's unacceptable. And, and, and you know what, coming out of COVID, we can do better in a lot of different ways. And let's make sure ag is, is a priority and let's clean up ag. Let's make it fair. And if we do that, you're going to see regional production across the U.S. boom, because all the farmers need here is an opportunity to compete and get on the shelf and make sure that when they're on the shelf, the, the competition on the other side has the same standard that they need to meet. So, so to my point, Jeff, yeah, grocers, let's go. Game time. Let's do it. What do we do? Come around the table, do a round table. There's only five grocers that really control the grocery industry in the U.S. So we don't need a lot of people at the table. Let's create a standard, create an ethical standard, make sure there's traceability. And if that's in place, then, then people like Amy, you're going to see those platforms explode around the country. So my question is, Jeff, how do we do it? Yep. So to that point, uh, shout out to Amy and Mike Gordon, our, our most gracious hosts and organizers of this whole thing. You know, Amy Christensen, maybe we should try to do some kind of a convening to Jonathan's point of the retail sector, right? So imagine Kroger and Amazon or Walmart on a webinar with Amy and Jonathan, you know, brokering that real time and hearing what they have to say, right? Because right now we're, you know, they're not here to defend themselves or tell us what their vision is for the future. Um, let me move to this notion of, uh, and, and people that know me, I use this example all the time, and please submit your questions in the chat box, but I use this example all the time. I'm in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. I'm surrounded by 28-year-old bright hipsters, somewhat naive but bright, and their vision of, and I'm being pejorative, so don't let anyone kill me, but their vision of farmers are good-looking guys with man buns and checkered shirts, right, and, and going to $100 a plate, you know, farm-to-table things. And I always laugh and say, well, that's not real farming, right? Real farmers aren't making any money. 
they're all bedraggled, they're tired, they wake up every morning worried they're going to go out of business the next day. So how do we tell this story? And why don't both of you, starting with Amy, so in your transformation model, what's the role of youth engagement, education? How do we change the narrative on farming? How do we make it appealing? How do we uh, generate jobs in this industry? Most farmers will tell you they, they have no one to pass their business on to. You know, there's a dearth of next generation farmers in this country. So tell me how your model addresses youth outreach and education. Jonathan, you should do the same after. Great. Thank you. Amazing question. I mean, I think the basis is in 2050, I'm going to be close to retirement age. So the people that are going to be leading this movement are the youth today. Um, I think that youth are inherently interested in natural systems in food and where their food comes from and healthy living, but don't actually have an easy way to get involved. Um, if you're not born into a farming family, it's really hard to become a farmer later on in life. You don't, if you're not born with land or resources, it's really hard to access those resources. And I think part of it is addressing some of those. So things like the Regen Ag Fund and other land transition opportunities like American Farmland Trust, they do so well. Those are key, but also um, one, making it like a good economic position, get people wanting to be involved in this sector because there is economic prosperity here. You can make a living. You can put your kids through college by working as a farmer or working in the food industry. I think that's key. And I think the second part is really this ag in the classroom piece. I know U of I, our land grant here does a pretty good job with this, but teaching students and youth what opportunities there are, whether it's food science, whether it's engineering, it's the tech innovation piece, it's the environmental biology, chemistry, physics piece. Like everyone can be involved in food system from the lens and the thing that they really are called to. And I think making that known to people is gonna be really important. And Jonathan? Yeah, I 100. I, I think history's on our side, Jeff. I mean, that's where you, we, we've got to engage with youth. Youth, our uh, company spent nearly uh, 150 thousand dollars early uh, at high schools across eastern Kentucky uh, to put technology, to put curriculum, uh, because we just weren't seeing it in our high schools. Our our state government was very supportive. They got us in quick. We ripped through and 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 we're, we're able to get curriculum in, but. Uh, young people, we need to just give them access to the information. And when they do, let them come up with the ideas on, on how they can better localize. Uh, but, but it's just a matter of you know, having these conversations so we understand what are the problems in agriculture? Let's talk about them. And then what are the solutions and how do we get there? Uh, but but our young people here are fired up, Jeff. It, it is phenomenal. And, and you know, the, this concept that, you know, if you go to any high school, and I don't know how it is in Idaho, but, you know, you go to many high schools around the country, you say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I want to be a doctor, an accountant, a lawyer, maybe play basketball or what, what have you. You know, we have got to get young people excited about, you know, growing food and, and, and having pride and, and growing good, healthy food. And, and we're seeing that work here in Kentucky. And, and we have got to engage the youth in, in the farming conversation of the future. Uh, and, and, and again, I think history's at our back on this where, where we do have, have wins behind us that will help push this forward. But, but it's going to be a long, hard fight uphill. Okay, so we've got a, a, little, a little under three minutes left. I wanted to end on one last topic. So clearly... Uh, the two things that have dominated our society here in the U.S. the last six months have been COVID, as we've discussed, and Floyd and racial injustice. I wanted both of you, uh, Amy first and then Jonathan last, just talk about how is your work and how does your vision address communities of color? Amy? Yeah, thank you for that. So I think, you know, one of the most obvious things here in Idaho is that we lack a lot of diversity. We are 85 percent white. Um, we do have a stronghold of tribal nations that are very underrepresented in agricultural sectors and decision making. And I think one thing our vision talks about is really engaging um, under disenfranchised voices to bring them into the decision making. That starts with farm workers. Um, a lot of farm workers here in Idaho are undocumented. Um, first generation and their voices need to be heard in the decision making. They also need opportunities to become owners and land owners and businesses to build their own social equity and um, wealth. And I think I don't have an answer because obviously not being a person of color, I don't want to speak on behalf of those here in Idaho, but I think we have an opportunity 
to honor the cultures that come here. We have refugee populations that can incubate, that are incubated by an organization called Global Gardens and really meeting people where they are and offering them opportunities to become voices and leadership in our region. Great, and Jonathan? Uh, yeah, Jeff, we think actions speak louder than words. Uh, our board is, is half minority, half women. Uh, our team is nearly, nearly half uh, female or minority. Uh, we, we've got investors high caliber across the board, but we've intentionally gone out to find uh, Blake Griffin, an investor, Kevin Johnson, uh, an investor. Uh, and and our, think about this, Jeff. You know, yes, very much here in, in rural central Appalachia uh, is, is predominantly white. Uh, but our director of community is an African-American gentleman from uh you know, the Brooklyn. And, and you know, we, we we're, we're trying to just not see color and, and put people in leadership roles, uh, give them a voice. But it's a real, real issue that we need a discussion coming out of, out of all this. You know, less than one percent of farmers in America are African-American. So uh, let's get influential people in farming uh, uh, with diverse backgrounds and let's give them a voice and, and let's get everybody a seat at the table. It's going to take a lot of people to reform ag uh, and we, we need passion from all sides. So uh, we, we definitely are doing our part to, to try to engage uh, as many people as possible. Great. I think with that, we've ended. But again, Amy, one quick shout out, perhaps something on diversity and ag in the future in this session. Then for the audience, it's a group called Black Capital that's mobilizing capital from African-Americans to African-Americans, so a, a heads up on that. And then lastly, for me, the notion of any of these enterprises allocating some percentage of their purchasing and procurement budgets to women and minority-owned businesses, women and minority-owned businesses, is a powerful tool to Jonathan's point to take action. So thank you, Amy. Thank you, Jonathan. And as always, thank you, uh, Amy Christensen and Mike Gordon. Uh, this was a wonderful session. Thank you all. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Amy, for sharing so much. It was, really, it was a really nice session opportunity to go a bit deeper into these topics, really understand. And I know there's so much more to talk about. I wanted to get into regionalized infrastructure and um, topics around equity and access for those most in need of food. And I know Amy's worked a lot with, local food, with um, our local hunger coalition around access to food and good food. Uh, for those most in need. So there's so many more topics we could we could learn from you guys and really looking forward to continue to support your work. And Jeff, thank you for the great ideas of some, some opportunities for us to bring together some sessions to help address some of the barriers that we heard about today. So very appreciative to all of great. you. And with that, we'll be jumping to our next session, which is about the vision innovation in our food system, hearing from Rockefeller Foundation, Generation Investment, and uh, a couple of other fantastic folks, Ron Finley, the gangster gardener from Los Angeles. So um, hearing directly from him, I think some pretty good truth telling, which I'm looking forward to. So look forward to jumping over there and seeing everyone there. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. It was a great conversation. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you.